the Son of Man must endure many terrible things. He will be rejected, tortured, and killed. But on the third day, he will rise. Father, I asked if this cup could be taken from me, but only if it was your will. Today, your will is done. The ones who mock me, the ones who strike me, the ones who drove these nails through my hands. Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't see what even the criminal beside me has seen. Now, it is finished. Welcome your children. May they now come boldly to the throne of grace. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember? The Son of Man was crucified and buried, but it's the third day. He is not here. He has risen. He's alive. If you have your Bibles, you take a turn in 1 Corinthians 15. That verse come, or that video comes out of the heart of Matthew 28 as it retells the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and poses this question that we all must answer this morning. As the disciples were told that Jesus was no longer in the tomb, they rush to the tomb, and as they get there, they're greeted uh, by, the two, by men in white robes uh, in their glory because they were not uh, normal human beings. They were angels. And the angels asked this question to the disciples. He asked this question, why do you seek the living among the dead? I don't know about you, but if I was walking through a graveyard, okay, if I'm going through a place where there are uh, dead bodies, multiple dead bodies, you know, six foot in the ground or in a hole in the hillside, uh, as I walk through that place, I want everything I see to be dead. You know, that's sort of the, the goal. If it's not, I'm going to be a little nervous. I'm going to be a little weirded out about what's going on. So uh, here's the disciples. They run into the graveyard, so to speak, into the garden to get to the tomb because they've heard that Jesus uh, is alive. They're looking uh, for a dead body. That's in their mind what they think they're going to find they're looking for a dead body in place where you put dead bodies but when they get there the angels ask him this question why do you seek the living among the dead and that started in their brain like what in the world is going on because the last they saw Jesus they rolled that stone in front of his tomb the Romans sealed it and put a guard out in front the last they saw Jesus was wrapped in grave clothes and he was very much dead why are the angels telling us that he's alive? Sort of an interesting thing, because we kind of think they should have known. They, they, Jesus, they're teaching, and they had the Old Testament, and they knew all these things that Jesus told them about that's going to happen. But even still, the people that were closest to Jesus, they came running into the garden looking for a dead person. And the angel says, no, he's not here. He's very much alive. You know, the truth is, though, we can't give them too hard of a time, because... I think many times we today do the very same thing, where we look for life among things that are dead. We try to take the things from this dead world and find purpose and life in them, whether a job or a hobby or a friendship or some kind of entertainment. Even the world 
sort of gets this concept, even though they think they get the result wrong, like is a typical storyline that you have this family, you have this dad who's on his phone too much and doing too much business and always at work. And as he goes through the process of the movie, he, you know, we could already kind of, we could, oh, I know how this is going to end. At the end of the story, dad's going to realize that work isn't worth it, that there are some things in his life that just aren't worth cons- being consumed by, and that where the answer is at uh, is back with his family, playing catch with his son or playing with, you know, with his little girls and, and being close to the family. I, I, think they, I think they're kind of headed in the right direction, that there are some things bigger in life than work, but uh, the, the central thing, the Bible says, except the Lord build a house, except the Lord is the center of our house, or our home, or our family, that it's vain, it's empty, uh, it's pointless. It's like looking for life. Uh, in the midst of something that's dead. We scour the globe looking for something to provide us comfort, something to give us control, something to give us significance, or to numb the pain. But as we learned last week in our first message in this series, the only thing worth that spot in our life is Jesus Christ is the the cross of Christ. Paul said, I glory only in the cross of Jesus Christ. All the accomplishments, all the things I do, all the things people say, wow, Paul, you're amazing. He says, I forget those things. The only thing I really have to glory, the only thing I can really hold up high is the trophy, as a trophy, is the cross of Christ. That's where Jesus died for me. If it wasn't for what Jesus did for me on the cross, I would just be among the billions of people that inhabited this planet and lived purposely, uh, purposelessly and aimlessly through this life and lived and died the end. But because of Jesus Christ, because of the cross, there is forgiveness. There is restoration to God. There is purpose infused into my otherwise insignificant life. Because I can now walk with God. I can worship God. I can glorify God. I can tell others about Him. No matter my vocation, I have a purpose. I have a mission because of the cross. But here's the thing. Without, if it was just the cross, if Jesus died and was put in the ground and there He stayed, that wouldn't be much of a story. There wouldn't be much to glory and there wouldn't be any great hope in that. There wouldn't be a reason to keep running. As we kind of consider this question, why? Like, why do we show up here uh, week after week? Why obey God tomorrow? Why keep going? Why keep reading about it? Why keep living the Christian race? Sometimes, you know, when you're a kid, uh, you'd ask your parents, why? And they would say, just do it, you know, because I'm dad, because I said so. You know, you don't need a reason. Just do it. I'm so thankful that the Bible isn't a book like that. The Bible gives a lot of commands, but the Bible also gives a lot of answers to the question, why? And we looked at one last week when we considered the cross of Christ, and this morning I'd like us to consider the resurrection of Christ as we answer a couple things here. Why are the disciples seeking the living among the dead? Why didn't they get it? Well, John chapter 20 and verse 9 uh, tells us, or verse 8 says this, and they went, uh, and then went also the other disciple, which is uh, came first to the sepulcher of the tomb, and when he saw, he believed. You know, he's, he's like, he's risen, he's not here, and he's like, oh, I can't, I, I gotta see it for myself. He must have been from Missouri, you know, and he runs into the tomb, uh, and he sees, and then he believes. He's starting to click. He's starting to, I, I almost imagine like the things that Jesus taught last week and the two months before all starts kind of coming in his mind. All the pieces start fitting together and he's like, oh, like you're going to rise from the dead. Like, like you were going to be, oh, you know, like he's having all these aha moments uh, at once. His mind perhaps is a, about to blow. But the Bible says this in verse 9, for as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. The reason the disciples didn't get it, the reason why the disciples were the closest people to Jesus, they were looking for the living among the dead, was this. They didn't understand the Bible. They didn't know the Scriptures. I mean, it wasn't like they had never heard them. It wasn't like they didn't know it, like they couldn't have passed the test. But the fact is, in their heart and the way they lived and their hope and their dreams and their focus uh it it was it was only on the death of christ and that was it their friend the one they had followed their teacher was gone and it was over so they came to find the body but the angel said he's not here he's risen just like he said come see the place 
where he lay. And then they started thinking about the words of God. They started thinking about what he taught. And I think all things, some of the things started to click in their mind. A few of them had some problems. Remember Thomas? He's not going to believe unless he can see the body. He's not going to believe unless he could put his hands and uh, his fingers in his hands and his hand in his side. And, and even still, these people that heard Jesus teach and were with him for three and a half years of his ministry, they're still not quite believing what Jesus said or what the Bible says. So what, what, what does the Bible say exactly? What what word for us today when we might go seeking the living among the dead, when we might find a motivation uh, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, does something that happened 2,000 years ago have any connection or significance for us today as City Light Baptist Church? Or for you today as a guest uh, here, maybe seeking, trying to uh, know about the things uh, of God, or maybe you're just like, dude, I am here because my family made me and I'm out for lunch right afterwards. I, I'm going to say thank you for being here. Appreciate you putting up with us and our crazy singing about Jesus and opening up this old book and explaining things that we believe and see from the Word of God. Let's think about this. What does the Scripture say? Well, Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel. The, the word means good news. It's the good news is there's the death of Christ. There's the burial of Christ. There's the resurrection of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul also gives us the verification of that resurrection. He says, he says the, this is the gospel I preach to you that you received and you stand in it by which also you were saved. You were born again. You received eternal life. If you keep, he says, you're saved if you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Maybe, maybe some of the church are like, okay, I'll just say it so the preacher gets off and back. I'll just do what they're doing because I want to fit in with the crowd. And Paul said, that's not real faith. That's not work. In your heart, you must 100% believe uh, uh, what the gospel is, that Jesus was God. That he died on the cross, he was buried and rose again to prove that he was God, to prove that he was bigger than your sin and bigger than your death. He says, I delivered this to you first of all, that which I received also, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Can I just stop there and say this, that Christ died for our sins. You know why? Because you couldn't do enough good things to undo your sins. You know, I think, remember the greatest lie the devil has ever told is that we can be good, good enough to get into heaven. Good enough to be made right with God. Man, I just get into some church somewhere, it doesn't matter, just pick one and get really good at it and be a good person and contribute to society, keep my nose clean. And when I get to heaven one day, then God will say, wow, you're impressive, come on in. Then why did Jesus die for our sins according to the scriptures? It's because my good works were never going to be good enough to undo all the wrong that I had done. That's why I need a Savior. And that's why that Savior is Jesus Christ, because He was alone perfect. He was alone holy. He alone was God in flesh. And that's why He could qualify to be my Savior, my Redeemer, and yours as well. In verse 4 He says, Then He was buried, and then He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now here's what's interesting about uh, this good news is there's proof the bible gives proof of the resurrection it doesn't just say jesus died was buried and rose again you should believe that just do it just go believe it that's what it says no uh, in fact when paul is writing to the church at corinth he goes on to say and that he was seen of cephas it's another way of saying the name peter he goes, and then he was seen of the twelve, all the, uh, the apostles. It was the, uh, now Judas isn't there. He killed himself with the, the guilt of turning Jesus in uh, to the religious leaders. But that's just the term that the twelve used for the followers of the disciples uh, of Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, he says, after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James and then of the apostles again. And, and at the last, he was also seen of me on the road to Damascus. I was the one born out of due time. I, I wasn't with all the other guys. I came a little bit later. You see, what the Bible teaches, what the scriptures say, what the disciples didn't get as they were with Jesus, it was only until they saw the empty tomb, was that the, fa the fact was this, is that Jesus was coming to earth to die for people's sins, that he was buried. They very much 
put him in the ground. And on the third day, he rose supernaturally, miraculously, an act of God from the grave to prove he was God. He wasn't just another man. He wasn't just a good teacher. He was God. And that didn't just end there, though. Paul says this. I'm going to, he goes, here's the deal is that you could ask people that it's saw him before, during, and after. I want you to see, first of all, what the Bible teaches it there, the gospel, that there is proof. Paul gives this argument. He goes, there's, Peter saw him. Remember Peter? You know, we've talked about Peter before. He's my friend. I, I met him back in Jerusalem a little while. He's still alive. You could, you could call Peter, guys, and he could verify this, what I'm saying to you. I'm not just making this up. He goes, and then he was also seen of the 12 or of the apostles. And uh, if you could find one of those guys, uh, uh, many of them were still living, breathing uh, on the earth at that time. You could talk one of them and they would let you know they saw Jesus die. They put Jesus in the ground. And three days later, he wasn't there anymore. In fact, they saw him walking around Jerusalem, teaching and preaching. And they watched him ascend back up into heaven. You say, that is weird. That is not normal. No human being can do that. And that's my point. Because he's God. And he says not only that, but he was also seen of 500 witnesses at once. He says the greater part remain to this day. You know, you could actually go and, and drive down to Jerusalem, guys, uh, and talk to one of these people who were there the day that Jesus died. They were there when they took him off the cross before the Sabbath and put him in the tomb. Uh, and then they were there after a few days, a few weeks later, and they're walking into town to get some vegetables at the market. And there he is, the guy that was on the cross, the guy that was bleeding, the guy that was pierced his hands and his, and his sides and his feet. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. Now look, think about it for a second. Why would Paul say, Jesus died, buried, rose again? And you could talk to people who actually saw that if it wasn't true. Because you know what would happen? People would... Say, all right, you, you guarantee you somebody from that church went, oh, that's, you know, someone from that town go, what? I'm going there. I've got an uncle. I'm going to write him a letter. You know, and, he, and write an uncle. An uncle sends back a letter. Yep, it's real. Fact check, verified. It's the real, it's the real deal. Paul is not hiding uh, the facts. He's not trying to cover them up. He's not trying to say, man, I hope they don't look into this because we're trying to manipulate these people and get money from them and do what I, He's like, we're, we're trying to control this crowd, so I'm going to say this, but I sure hope they don't fact check me. No, he said, there's proof. My friend today, if you're here and a, a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not just you haven't made some leap into the darkness. You haven't made just some random, well, I don't have anything else. Maybe I'll try this. No, there's the death. There's the burial. There's the resurrection, and there is the verification of that resurrection. This is the argument that Paul uses. You know, if, if you're here today, maybe go, I don't know if I can buy into all this. I'll give you a few things to look into. Number one would be the witness of the women. You know, the, as the, if the apostles were trying to make something that they could become in, you know, come into power, or that they could control the masses, or that they could gain financially from it, the worst thing they could do in their historical context would be to come to people and say, we were scared, hiding in an upper room, and the ladies were brave enough to go out and, and figure this out. Okay, The ladies saw him first. First of all, in a court of law during that time, a lady's witness was nothing. Not only that, it would, it almost, it would indicate that they were scared, that they were chicken, that they were whips, and the ladies had a little more guts than they did. That's If I was trying to gain control of a population, if I was trying to make myself look good, or establish a false religion, I probably wouldn't start there. And I don't think they would either. The other thing is this, is that as this message began to circulate through Jerusalem, as, as people began to say, Jesus is risen, he's not there, he's risen for the dead, oh my goodness, uh, and people, like, they were gathered around, all, all the religious leaders who hated Jesus, the people who just a few days earlier were saying, crucify him, crucify him, we want him dead, give us Barabbas, all those people would have to do is go and the, the, the Roman soldiers, uh, the, the, the guard who f fainted and as, as were dead, laying on the ground when Jesus exited uh, the, the tomb, uh, the leaders there who were worried about losing control to this king of the Jews, Jesus, all they had to do to squash this rebellion and to end the confusion and the buzz that's going around the city and these Christians who are spreading the message of the gospel, all they have to do is go find the body and drag it out in the middle of the street and go, there's your Savior, 
There's your risen Lord. He's still dead. See, that's, that's the only thing they would have had to done. The message of Christ would have never gotten to the Americas if those folks would have just produced a body. So we have to think. we got 11 fishermen, tax collectors, uneducated men who have manipulated the Jewish leaders and the Roman Empire enough so that they can't find the body. Just hours ago, they were, they were hiding. They had denied Jesus. They had run away from even the cross. And now they have this boldness. They have the, this cunning craftiness ability to pull one over on the Roman government. All they had to do is produce the body and it's over. The reason that Christianity, the reason that we're here today is because they couldn't produce a body. And why not? It's because Jesus was risen. He was very much, he was very much alive. The other thing is that he was seen of 500 people at once. It'd be one thing to get the apostles together and go, guys, we can't, we've been following this guy for like three and a half years. It's going to look really bad if he's, if he's dead. Like, so let's just do this. Let's go, let's go beat up the Roman guards and, uh, that are surrounding the tomb, uh, and let's make them all pass out uh, and like they lay there like they're dead, and let's roll the stone back, get the body, and go hide it somewhere where no one will ever find it. I'm sure uh, we'll all be able to do that without any witnesses and no one finding out where we are. Let's, uh, let's go do that, and let's just let's make a pact between each other that we're never going to change our story. He rose from the dead well I can sort of see that possibly where 12 guys could do that but what about the day when Jesus showed up in front of 500 men not to even number their wives or their children and there he is very much alive very much teaching and preaching I wonder why Jesus showed up to them that day it was to verify to prove his resurrection to prove that he was God, to prove that it wasn't just another man or a good teacher, uh, but to verify the truth that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead. One of the most compelling arguments I think you have to consider is this, is that men don't die for a lie. Men don't die for a lie. You know, someone might die for what they think is true, Someone could take a plane and run it into a building thinking something's true, and it's not. But men don't die for a lie. Hey, let's make up this lie and trick people and get people's money and do this. Uh, and then they say, all right, we're going to kill you if you don't denounce the name of Jesus Christ. And they hold on to the lie. No, eventually, after eight of your friends die, after ten of your friends die, you're going to be the last guy. You go, you know what? I, nope, not me. We made it up. I confess. I want to live. One of those guys would have cracked. Because people don't die for a lot. Why were they willing to die for the cause of Christ? Because it was the truth. It was verified. They verified with their own eyes. They saw Jesus after the resurrection. I want you to see also the connection. There's a connection here for us. You say, okay, great. Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. What does that have to do with 2019? What does that have to do with me? Does it make any real difference in my life? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I point your attention to the word first fruits. It, 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 there was a Jewish feast called the Feast of first fruits, where at the time of harvest, the very first grain, the very first corn, or, or whatever they're, they're making out there, whatever they're uh, growing out there, they'd bring it in, and there'd be this big celebration to thank God for the rain, to thank God for another uh, round of crops. They're going to be able to live another year because of what God has provided for them. They have this big feast of first fruits. It wasn't all uh, the, the vegetation. It wasn't all the things that they were growing. It was just the first round. It was just the first harvest from the first day, and they would celebrate it, and then they'd go out for the next several days or weeks and bring in all the stuff that they'd been growing all summer long. The Bible says that Jesus' resurrection, that he's the first fruits of those that will rise from the dead. It could be said this way, that Christ is the first in a long line of those who will leave the grave. You see, the connection is this, is that if your faith is in Jesus Christ, the one who 2,000 years ago rose from the grave, what he taught and what he said was this, if you believe in me, I'm the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, uh, you will not die. 
that you'll have eternal life. I give unto them eternal life, and they will never perish. Either, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Jesus promised eternal life. He promised resurrection for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus was the first. But he's the first in a long line of people through the ages who when they put their faith in Christ can have a confident hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That one day he will resurrect our body as well and that will be in heaven with him for all eternity. I know if you're not a believer, that might sound kind of strange. I would think, man, these are weirdos talking about like alien stuff. But I just point you back to the proofs that I've already given you. I want to encourage you to investigate those proofs and see uh, how substantially true the Bible is. And then if it was right on these areas, if it was on these issues, in your, in your worship guide's a little article called, What are the Odds? I wanted to preach, I wanted to fit that in the message and talk about that. There wasn't time, and so I just put it in there. Because maybe you are seeking and thinking through, is the Bible true? Can I, can I trust it? Can, it, it? What it says, is it, is it real? Uh, and there's a, an incredible article, and it's, it's kind of a, a summarized version, so you can go online and find a longer one. It's, uh, I've read it in a number of books throughout the years. Uh, but it kind of shows the mathematical odds that eight of the, prof- eight of the over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, uh, that what are the odds that eight of them could be true? It's kind of off the charts. You can take a look at that because I told you I don't have time to preach that today. So I have to keep going. The connection is this. Jesus first and will be next. The resurrection 2,000 years ago is so vitally important to our faith because if there was no body uh, found in the grave just dead there then for the believer in Christ we have that same faith we have that same hope Jesus was the first fruits <coughs> number three there is victory at the end of this chapter all about the resurrection uh, Paul says this so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and when this mortal shall have put on immortality he's talking about his own body and when this corruptible body This body that's getting older every day. This body that's falling apart. On Friday night, I helped my dad install some wood flooring uh, in in their new house. And I'm getting down on the ground and banging in nails. And he's got these little fancy boards, the fancy square nails. They have to be straight. And we get down there with a hammer. uh, And and we're working away for five or six hours. And the next morning, I I reach over to to help one of my little girls. And I reach out. I'm like, whoa, what was that? You know, I'm like falling apart. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, what did I do? And I'm like, oh. Oh, yeah, I, I worked, you know, like I like did something that I normally don't do. You know, 10 years earlier, that wouldn't have affected me to just get up and, and go. But uh, now that I'm in my 20s, it's really starting to, it's really starting to bother me. It's starting to slow down. Uh, why did you laugh at that? I don't understand. Paul says, hey, when this corruptible body, this body that's going to decay and die one day, the day when it puts on incorruption, the day when this mortal body this body that's not guaranteed that it's going to make it to tonight, when this mortal body puts on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying that is written that death is swallowed up in victory. Because of the resurrection, our death, not only Jesus' death was swallowed up in victory, but our death is swallowed up. Our death is defeated so that we can say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? He says, Now there is a sting to death it's sin and the sinful world that we live in and the hurts and the pains that we experience we feel the sting but for the believer in Christ that's all it is it's not a death blow the strength of sin it's the law the Bible says like when we read all the commands about the holiness of God and what he requires for someone to be able to perfectly enter into heaven and when we read the scriptures we realize we fail that miserably we come nowhere close that's why Jesus came to earth to die for us it says but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory how through our Lord Jesus Christ the victory is ours look if you know Christ as your Savior, my friend, the connection for us is that there is victory. Your body one day will fall apart. Your spouse may not make it through the week, but if their faith is in Christ, 
There is a hope. There is a comfort. There is an assurance of a resurrection promised and secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And our faith is in Him. And we have that promise and assurance that one day we will have victory over death. That one day we will rise. That the sting of death, the sting of sin will not defeat us and keep us in the grave but that we'll have eternal life like Jesus Christ. One of my first years of playing football, we played Division III college in Wisconsin. We played this school named Mount Scenario. When we got off the bus and saw these guys, I thought that like I got off at the University of Wisconsin. I didn't know they were just huge. And you look at the roster, there's like 70 guys on the roster. We have like 35 guys on our roster. They have like 50 guys from South Florida, and I'm thinking, how do you get guys from South Florida all the way up to northern Wisconsin into a Division Three? You know, it wasn't like a big, uh, like they're on TV or anything like that. Uh, and they got busted a few years later for illegal recruiting, and so uh, our, our third year actually beat them because they didn't have any players at all. They just had four players. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but we were on offense. I was playing fullback. The quarterback threw the ball, and I think probably every time he threw the ball, there was an interception. Uh, and and they, they got the ball, and they're running back, and here's this defensive lineman that I've been trying to just, I mean, he's been tearing me up all day long, and he doesn't see me, and I'm like, oh, here's my chance. I am going to crush this guy, and he's kind of he's run back. He sees his buddy intercept the ball, and he's getting ready to churn, and as he's churning, I'm like, oh, here's my chance. I'm going to level this guy, and I come running, and I fly up at him, and with everything that I have, I nail this guy, and he goes, ugh. Like that, I mean, that's literally all he did. And he like looked over, and he all I remember is feeling these hands on the back of my shoulder pads. And he took me and he went like this, uh, and I just went like whoa, 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 you know. Uh, and I fall on the ground, uh, and I'm laying on the ground thinking, do I want to get up? <laughs> you know, do I want to get up? Uh, and I and I get up, and as I'm getting off and trying to straighten myself back out, he walks by and he says, boy. <laughs> He goes, you need to get in the weight room. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Like, I, mean, I, thought, I, mean, I thought I was somebody. I thought, man, I was going to level this guy. I'm going to crush this guy. And he didn't even, it was just like a, like a sting. And you know, that's the same way, I think, that day on the cross as they put Jesus in the tomb and they wrapped his body and rolled the stone. It was like death. It was like the devil was like, yo, we're going to nail him. We got him. Here we go. We're going to crush him. Three days later, Jesus walked out of the tomb, almost as if he went, Ugh. try again. Get back in the weight room. Do something different. I'm God. I'm bigger than sin. I'm bigger than death. I provide the victory. My friend, that's the same way we can live today. And we can look at death and we can look at the hurt and the pain and the aggravation and the frustration of this earth. And we can live in victory over it. Because the worst, the, the best they have is a sting on us. They'll deliver, deliver no death blows. Because when we believe in Jesus, the Bible says we'll never die. You say, wait a minute, my grandma believed in Jesus, she died. Yes, but understand this, the Bible says to be absent from that body is to be present with the Lord. The real you that lives inside of you, if you have faith in Christ, it's been made eternally alive so that the moment this body stops working, your soul is right into heaven, right with Christ. There's a victory there that we have because of the resurrection. So what do we do with that exactly? Peter said it best in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 when he said, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, He's begotten us unto a lively hope, a living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here's the connection that I want to draw back to the very first part of the message where we looked at the disciples and they're looking for the living among the dead. They're trying to find uh, this purpose or meaning uh, there and it's not there because Jesus is risen. Certainly it's true for us as we, even as believers, many times we get sidetracked and off into some pursuit of this world that isn't going to fill the void in our life that only uh, God's will and God's plan and God's way for our life uh, will, will fill it. We try to find life in all of these dead things of the world, and it doesn't work. But 
Peter reminds us that we have a living hope. That we should seek life in something that's living. In something that's alive. Something that's eternal. The word living hope. First one I want you to point, point, point to is the word hope. It, it means the confident assurance based on the word of God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Understand that people use the word hope differently than what the Bible gives to us. When the Bible uses the word hope, it is this confident expectation. It is a, a, an expectation based on the facts, based on the life of Christ and his resurrection, that what he said uh, is true. I read this week, someone said, if a man walks out of his own grave, he is who he says he is, and what he says is true. And that's the person we're following. That's the one who we're believing. And that's where our faith is in. So what he says is true. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, you'll never die. There is a hope, a confident expectation. This week I made a Facebook post and I just asked people, help me with my sermon. Finish this sentence. I hope. And you finish it. And I asked, I asked some of you not to be, you don't have to be super spiritual, you know, just give me the answer, like, I hope the Rams lose all their games this year out in L.A., or I want the Cardinals to win the World Series, or I hope I get a steak for dinner, or uh, whatever. And some of you are so spiritual. Let me commend you uh, for all your spiritual answers. But some people were just like real, uh, and they said, uh, one guy said, million dollars. And I was like, well, that's not good English, but I think I understand what you're saying. I hope I get a million dollars, and good luck with that, you know, like... That's sort of like hope, wish, think. Maybe that'd be cool, wouldn't it? That's my hope. That's not the way the Bible uses this word hope, that we have a living hope, a confident expectation in Christ. When I was about 11 years old, I had this little side, a little job at, at a bank. Uh, and they didn't let me touch the money, but I got to water all the flowers outside. Uh, and it was a new bank, a new vegetation, so it had to be watered a couple times, three times a week. Uh, and I had to do it a certain way. You know, uh, and here I am out in the sun. I'm picking weeds and watering these flowers and, and just taking care of it. And it was just like boring, monotonous work. Every, uh, the, the clock on the bank, I had to watch it. Hold the water hose three minutes and just water, 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 three minutes, go to the next one. Water, water, water. And it, was, you know, it was good money for a 12-year-old, 11-year-old. But, but the fact is, it was, it was sort of boring. You know, as I sat there in, uh, in, my, in my little uh, child, imag child imagination, I sat there by the drive through of the bank. And I understand, I didn't know how these things worked back then. But I thought, man, look at me out here earning $5 an hour watering this flower. Uh, and all of these people in their fancy cars come drive up and they give the bank thousands of their dollars to hold on to, you know. Because that's what everybody does every time they go uh, through the drive through of the bank. They just fork over all this cash for them to hold on to. And my thought, I, I thought this, man, when I see a really really nice car, you know, like uh, one that's not a station wagon, <laughs> uh, you know, like something like that, like come up, uh, I'm going to start working really hard. I'm going to do my job even better. Like instead of doing this, I'm going to do this, you know, like, uh, and I want, I'm going to impress someone so much that they're going to, they're going to say, you know what, instead of giving this thousands of dollars to the bank, I'm going to hold it back. I'm going to give this young man over here who's working so hard, I'm going to give it to them and I'm going to never have to work another day in my life. Uh, because someone's going to just come by and see how awesome I am and give me all this money. I really, I really, I'm sorry, but I really thought that, you know. And, and so, I mean, I was hoping, I was wishing, I was trying to, everything I do to, to make it, you know, to do it. And I've been, I've been awesome for 38 years now. No one's ever done that to me. I mean, that's how, that's how it just hasn't panned out for me. But here's the, here's the thing, like, that's hoping, wishing in something that's very much dead. And here's the deal. Our faith in Christ, the Bible says, describes it as a living hope. There's a lady named Jemima Wilkinson. You can look her up in the late 1700s. Here in America, she proclaimed herself to be the daughter of God. She had a small following of people that followed her and listened to her teachings and did what she said. And uh, one day she died. But before her death, she told people, don't, don't bury me in the ground. Just leave me lay out. As the story is told, as she died, they laid her out. Why? Because she taught, in three days, I will come back to life. Do you know? She never did. I think eventually they probably buried her, you know, did something with her remains. See, the, the truth of the matter is, is that your faith is only as good as the object that you put it in. We were putting those floors in 
there was a couple points where like it, it was like you know our hands were busy and I was like here just uh, hit the nail and here my dad has this five pound hammer uh, and he get and he gets ready I'm like no 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 you're gonna figure it out he said you don't trust me I said dad uh, you know you don't have faith in me I said dad my faith is only as good as the object that I put it in and I'm not trusting you with my with my hands and a hammer you know I said you have to, to do that yourself look you could put your faith in Jemima Wilkinson but you'd be seeking for the living among the dead. Or you could put your faith in Jesus Christ and you'd be looking for someone who is today very much alive and offers eternal life for all those who would believe. The Bible also tells us that this is a living hope. It's a living hope. It's, it's living because, first of all, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. There are other faiths, there are other religions, there are other spiritual leaders, moral people, but eventually they all die, and they stay that way. A book I've been reading called Turning Everyday Conversations into Gospel Conversations, the author offers this. He says, when Paul recorded these words, the fact checkers could have gone and found almost 500 people that would say, yes, I saw Jesus on the cross, yes, I saw Jesus put in the grave, and I saw Jesus later very much alive walking around. He is not dead, he's alive. And that makes him unique among religious figures. Buddha was alive. He was Siddhartha Gautama. He was a member of the clan of Gautama, and he was born in Nepal. And when he was 29 years old, he set off on his own spiritual journey of self-denial and contemplation. Buddha lived an exemplary life, and then he died. And he stayed dead. Muhammad was also alive. He was born in AD 570 in an Arabian city called Mecca. He claimed to have received the first revelation of God when he was 40 years old. He wrote his special revelations down in what we now know as the Quran. Muhammad lived a very religious life. But when he was 63 years old, he died. And he stayed dead. Hinduism has a plurality of gods. In, in 1966, Swami Prabhupada uh, started an American neo-Hindu movement entitled uh, Hare Krishna. His teachings propagated the achievement of a higher spiritual state known as Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada was still striving to attain this pure state of mind in 1977 when he died. And, as he, and, and when he died, he stayed dead. Jesus also died but he did not stay dead jesus is alive seated in the heavenly realm with his fathers uh, with his father and he will return one day to judge the living and the dead to judge based on the answer to this question who do you say that jesus is god said in first john 5 the one that has the son has life has a living hope but if you don't have the son of god if you don't have jesus as your only faith the Bible says you don't have life because you have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. The faith that Jesus Christ acquired when he died on the cross and was buried and rose again is a living faith. It is a living hope because Jesus is alive. It's also living uh, in the sense uh, that it is active in our own lives. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We serve. We keep running the race. We keep going another day through another struggle, through another year, through another difficulty. By faith, we keep uh, on going because the, our faith is very much alive that what we're doing right now on this earth uh, matters, that God cares, uh, that God uh, commands us to go, that God empowers us to go and to be like him, to shine uh, in the places that, that we live. It's active. It's also a living hope and because it cheers and enlivens. Can you imagine being stranded on a desert island? You're like, wait, go on vacation? No, I mean like worse than that. Like, you know, there's no food uh, and there's no water uh, and you're on uh, a desert island. Man, you've been there forever and you're just, you just can barely even move a muscle. The sun comes up. You don't even bother. You just, you just can barely... Uh, and as you lay there and you think, man, this will probably be the day that I die. 
All of a sudden, you hear this noise in the distance. It gets louder and louder, and as you look up, you faintly see a helicopter. The search party comes flying overhead. What do you think you would do? Oh, I'm here. It's me. You know, no. Any, any, you, you've seen the movies. You know, we've all been there before. Uh, you, you know, they jump up like, hey, hey, I'm over here. You know, all of a sudden we've got energy. All of a sudden there's life. All of a sudden there's vigor for, you know, for hey, because why? The presence of hope that I'll be rescued. The presence of hope that I'll be saved. It alivens us. And we answer the question, why? Why keep living for Christ? Why go another day? Why serve Jesus with our life? It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a living hope. It is very much alive. And for the believer who gets to a place in your life where you feel like, I'm just going to quit. It's not worth it. I don't want to go another step. It's too hard. It's not what I thought it was going to be. May I encourage you to look at the cross. May I encourage you to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ and find the life that flows from it. It should enliven us. Also, it's living because it doesn't fade away. It's not like your tax return. You know? I mean, you had big plans with that thing this year, didn't you? And you thought our whole lives are going to be different because I got this, you know, six, seven, ten thousand dollars that's coming. That's why I had 18 kids so I could get a, you know, big tax return. And man, this is going to be awesome. And before you know it, it's gone. And you're like, oh man, it faded away. And now what happened to it? And you got to like sit back in your mind and go, all right, 250 there and 3,000, you know, like you try to like add it up. Like, oh, that's where it went. Like, it's gone. Well, the Bible says that. In this living hope, it's an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled and that doesn't fade away. Have you ever put your hope in somebody or something and before long, it was kind of gone? But man, that person's going to change my life. And they were gone. Man, that job, it's going to be the job. I've been waiting for my whole life for this job. And here, here it is. And then it wasn't exactly what sort of faded. It's okay, but it just wasn't what we thought it was going to be. The Bible says our hope in Jesus Christ is alive because it's not going to corrupt. It's not going to get lost. It's not, not going to diminish over time. But it's reserved in heaven, kept by the power of God for us. It's also a living hope because it deals with life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, though you were dead, yet you'll be alive. And whosoever believeth, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And Jesus asked this question, believest thou this? Do you believe this? My friend, what I want for your life is that you would stop seeking the living among the dead. This world has nothing to offer you that's better than Jesus Christ. Religion False teachers, things that don't line up with the scripture, things that deny the deity of Christ and what he did for us on the cross and through his his death and his uh, resurrection. My friend, those things are dead. But Jesus is very much alive. I would encourage you rather to seek life in the living. Seek life in the one who lives. Seek life in the one that death and hell could not kill. Seek life in the one who offers you life even after he gave you life when he created you. This week I heard a guy say to another guy, you're in good shape. You're going to live to be like 95, he said. My first thought, honestly, when he said that, I was like, man, I hope not. I don't know. Like, I, just, I, mean, I think like... I, I don't want to die today, but 95, if you're 95, I apologize, but think about it. You're like, man, that's a lot. You know, like, I just want to get to, I was, uh, yeah, a few more years, you know, whatever, but uh, eventually I'm thinking, I, I'm ready, I'm ready to go to heaven. You know, this guy turned around and said to him, he goes, I hope so. And, and the way he said it just kind of struck me as odd because it was like, he was saying like, you know, this is it. Like, this is, this is all I have. Is this this one life? And so, yes, I want every day I can get out of it because he had no living hope. I guarantee you that guy has no idea 
what's going to happen to him after this life. Because he doesn't have Jesus. My friend, what Jesus offers is living hope. What Jesus offers isn't a perfect life, isn't no problems, isn't a million dollars in the bank, isn't no diseases. He promises his presence and power through this sinful world and to an eternity where he rewards those who by faith seek him and live for him and put their faith in what he did for us when he died on the cross, was buried, and when he rose again. Don't seek the living among the dead. If you do, you'll eventually quit, even for the believer. But hope in the one who is alive. Hope in Jesus Christ. Let's bow our head and close our eyes.